we are not intended to live in isolation. Human beings need each other. The things about another that pisses you off and the things that take you off the media are all opportunities to see through another's eyes, recognize their intrinsic value, and then look more deeply within ourselves to find the love that's always there. And here we are, another episode of my podcast that I love doing so much. Because we need each other, you know, it's just, it's the perfect name to me. We need each other because if we could just realize that more and more, mm-hmm. it would maybe help us to get to know each other. You know, I think that's part of what's missing is people don't really get to know each other. They size each other up by what they think somebody is, but we need each other. We need to understand. And I'm telling you what this woman does, I know we need. So we have as our guest today, Jessica Parm. She is a free-thinking HR professional with a background in employee relations, recruitment, training, and employment law and policies. She believes in advocating for and assisting Black professionals as they struggle to to navigate the complicated and stressful world that is corporate America. In 2020, she founded Blackness and the Workplace whose mission is to empower Black professionals by providing resources, guidance, and support within a safe place to speak truth to power about the uniqueness of our shared experiences and identities. Jessica aims to elevate the conversations around Black professionals by centering and valuing our experiences in a safe and protected space. Unapologetic, my favorite word, unafraid and uncompromising, Jessica wants Black professionals and our allies to know that she cares and will continue to use her voice to speak on the topics others either can't or won't. Jessica Parm, welcome to We Need Each Other. So glad to be speaking with you. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm excited about what you do, having you know, maneuvered my way through corporate America many, many years ago. And it was, um, you know, as a black person, very few in, in whatever job you're in, you know, you really are maneuvering your way and trying to figure it out and trying to sidestep this and, you know, and it's, it's just wonderful. So um, I I'd love to hear a little bit about your background. Mm -hmm. Like where are you from? How'd you get to, to where you are? So I am from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, so born and raised. Mm-hmm. So if anyone knows Milwaukee, I was born and raised on the north side in Sherman Park. So a okay. little tidbit there. Uh, my background, getting to where I am, it, it took a lot of many twists and turns. You know, I mm-hmm. graduated from Rufus King High School, Generals, again, a um, little inside for folks from, <laughs> from Milwaukee. And then I went to college, UW-Madison, which really prepared me for being the only black person in a lot of mm-hmm. spaces because UW-Madison mm-hmm. is a PWI, which is a predominantly white institution. So yeah. that was a huge culture shock for me. But in a lot of ways, it prepared me for what I was going to go through when I got into the working world world. Um, And after I graduated, I wanted to go into communications and film, but life has a way of taking you where you're supposed to be as opposed to where you want to be. So um, customer service, project management are some of the fields that I worked in for a time. And then I landed in HR by way of being a recruiter for a company known as Manpower. And from Uh there, yeah, I just, I moved up, took on um, different assignments, you know, kind of worked on getting skilled up. And that's where I, that's where I'm at right now, still doing recruiting mm-hmm. and HR. So mm-hmm. it's a lot of little, like I talk about on my platform, you know, the good, bad, and ugly. But I'm here, and so I turn around and try to impart the knowledge that I've learned on others. Mm, very good. I'm curious what your, for, as a child, mm-hmm. what you observed about what your thoughts were about people in the workplace. Or people out in the work world. So does that make sense? Yeah. So Mm -hmm. when I was a kid, and and when I say kid, especially like when I first started working as a teenager, I guess that's Uh, that's uh uh uh-huh. I was always taught that work is work. You know, my parents Uh, came from a generation where a lot of these terms, we say like bring your authentic self and work life balance and all these self care things. When it comes, that just wasn't that didn't exist. My parents was like a job. No. 
Right. It pays the bills. You mm-hmm. go home. You you know, friends are like, like my mom was like, friends, coworkers are not friends. You mm. don't talk about your personal life at work. Mm. No one cares about your personal life at work. You really want to keep those two worlds separate. It was very black and white, very draconian when it came to my viewpoint, uh, when it came to working world. Also, when I started working, I worked with a lot of people who were, you talking, 10, 20 years older than I am. Mm. So for a long time, I had a very strict mentality when it came to work. You know, no one talked about their personal lives at work. No one talked about what they did on a Saturday night. No Mm -hmm. one talked about, you know, the you know, bringing their authentic selves. Black people didn't talk about racism and discrimination in the workplace because it was just like, you lucky to have a job, just work yeah, and go home. Right, right. Then when you get home, like, you know, so um, those are the things that I observed and dealt with as a kid coming up, you know, working mm-hmm. and seeing how the adults around me handle those situations. How much of that do you find proves to be true still in your, in your work life? Oh, I'm a firm believer that coworkers are okay. not friends. You know, right, I, right, I still right. pr- promote that. Um, mm-hmm. I, feel, I think I don't think there's anything wrong with coming to work, working, and go home if that's what you want to do. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's anything wrong with setting boundaries and and keeping your personal and your professional life separate. I think there's a lot of plus to that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't feel like you should be forced into being friends or having to do with people outside of working hours. I think mm-hmm. that mindset has really helped me a lot as I, as I, as I grown up, mm-hmm. there's other things that my parents and other people have taught me that I don't agree with, you know, especially being a black person in the workplace where it's like, well, if you are dealing with discrimination or things that aren't right, don't speak up, just go home because mm. you don't want to lose your job. You know, my, my parents used to say, you got a good job. Oh, yeah. You know, black- well, yeah, that's the way it was. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Right. That's a, yeah. Right. 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 Don't rock the boat. You got a good Bro, job. Don't rock the boat. Don't, mm-hmm. You know, that's what they used to say all the time. You got a good job. And it's like, yeah, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. I have to go to work and I have to bring myself into the workplace in order for me to thrive. So there's mm-hmm. pros and cons to how I was brought up. And there's some things that I kept and there's some things that I had to let go because times have changed and have evolved. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I remember an experience I had in the workplace. This was actually the last corporate job that I had uh, in Denver, Colorado, working at the number one television station in the market. And I was one of very few black people in the entire station, the only one on my floor and certainly the only one in sales and marketing. And, you know, it was must-see TV back in those days with Seinfeld mm-hmm. and Friends and all of that. And Man, it was annoying because I'm working because we had cubicles at that time and I'm working and oh man, at some point during the day, they were all talking about what happened on Seinfeld and they're all talking about what happened on Friends and now they're disturbing me because I don't watch those shows and I don't really care. And I at one point went into my my uh, boss, boss, I don't even call him a boss, never did, my manager's office and said, I need you to understand my life is different. Yeah. So when you come out and everybody's talking about Friends and Seinfeld, black people watch New York Undercover on Thursday night. We oh, yeah. I remember that show. Yeah. Every uh, black person in the United States of America was watching New York Undercover. Undercover. And I said, and so, you know, I understand that you're all excited about it, but understand that that's not my world. And so, like, you have just left me out of your conversation that I don't want to be in. And, you know, we had we had a really great conversation about it, but it was just that thing. It's like, you need to understand who I am. I'm here. Yeah. You know, don't forget I'm here and I'm not like you. Yeah. It's funny that you said that because there was a time for every white show, there was a black alternative. So you had friends, but you had living single. You had, you had Seinfeld, you had Martin. Like, (laughs) you know, we we had our own black versions, like the Wizard of Oz, you had the Wiz. Like we all had our own own black version. And I didn't watch any, I didn't watch Seinfeld or, you know, Frazier. I watched you know, Martin living single in living right. color. We had our own things. And so, you know, I also talked about this recently too. There, especially in the workplace, it's important to understand that there's differences in culture between white people and black people and, you know, other groups of people. And one thing that I always bring up is small talk. You know, mm. you, when you're with your white coworkers, they love to do small talk and they, they talk about things that are very frivolous and just not important as a means to break the ice. 
Yeah. But I always say the way I was brought up as a black person is you don't speak unless you have something important to say. Right, right. Like, mm-hmm. We don't have silly conversations or we don't feel the need to fill the empty space with talk just for the sake of talk. Like, mm-hmm. And I've, I've run into trouble with that at work because then people say, oh, you're not friendly. Yes. You're not approachable. Mm-hmm. And it's like, that's not the case. It's, we don't communicate the same way. It's important mm-hmm. to understand that there are those differences in how we communicate and what we talk about. And black people by and large do not believe in small talk. No, <laughs> it's just exactly. not part of the right. conversation. Right. And that's why it's important, as you just said, to get to know what other cultures are like, you know, we can't whitewash, whitewash everything. Right. You know, it's not all through your gaze. It's like, we have our own way of being and, you know, that's what's important. I, uh, one question that came up while you were talking is, do, since you're in your workplaces, you've been one of only or very few black people, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. So do you feel like you've been like a curiosity for white people at work? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I definitely get those questions. Um, like when I wear my hair different, like I put mm-hmm. braids in my hair or wear a natural. I've had conversations, white people try to I've never had anybody say anything disrespectful, but I do get those questions. Oh, your hair is really nice. Is You know, I, I can mm-hmm. sense that they want to ask more about my hair. So th- that has been something that I've dealt with. Or when like the Black Lives Matter thing has been popping, you know, you get white people who try to answer those questions about like, how do I feel about what's mm-hmm. going on in the country and try to get me to speak. And I've been really quick to shut down a lot of those conversations. I'm not going to be this token black person. Mm-hmm. I don't believe in speaking for everybody. I don't yeah. speak for every single black person. I can only speak for myself. Mm-hmm. So um, I've been really clear about where I stand on a lot of those issues. And I remember being a young black professional and really struggling with my hair, you know, wearing it straight, permanent yeah. to death so I can fit mm-hmm. in, you know, trying to have small talk conversations about things that I either don't know about or don't care about that, that are not relevant to my life. And in an attempt to try to blend in, try to smile, be more mm-hmm. passable. And I used to do that a lot. You know, I mm-hmm. talk about that. You trying to assimilate and it really came at a personal cost to me, you know, mm-hmm. really impacted my emotional and my physical health, too, because I was trying to be something that I wasn't. Yes, now, it's something that I think that they don't understand. They, they just don't, don't get it. understand. They don't get it. Yeah. Um, and that's where you are now unapologetic. Yeah, now I'm just like, look, I, I wear my hair. I wear my hair right. natural, even on an yeah. interview. Like, I come as right. myself. Mm-hmm. I'm very outspoken on my, my platforms. And when I... When I interview for jobs and talk to people, I always say, you know, go out to my LinkedIn profile, go listen to the podcast. Mm, Know who I am. I would know who I am before we even go further, because the last thing I want is to get in an environment where you're trying to restrict me or try to, you know, edit my voice. I've had that experience just recently at a a previous employer, and I don't ever want to go through that again. So Mm. this is who I am. And I love to see that there are more and more black people, especially coming through the ranks who are like, look, this is who I am. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm unapologetic and Mm -hmm. you either take it or you or you leave it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So tell me why you from your perspective, there is a need to advocate for and assist black professionals and how to navigate through corporate America. Oh, because there's a so need many, there. There's mm-hmm. a need because there's so many minefields in black America that if mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. I have stepped on and have blown mm-hmm. up in my face. And mm-hmm. a lot of black people who are entering these spaces, you got to look at look at where they're coming from. So a lot of these people are like me, where I was a first generation college student. So that in and of Mm -hmm. itself presented a lot of challenges because there was resources that I didn't know about or did not Mm. have access to, which really stunted me going through college. And then, you know, you talk about college, you talk about internships and getting opportunities to work at some of these big companies. A lot of us don't have that. And so then you coming in already at a disadvantage into these spaces where it's hard to find like mentors and sponsors. I talk about that a lot, um, where you don't 
when there's a lot of cultural differences like we just talked about where it comes to small talk professionalism is also rooted in white culture yes. what yes. you think is professional may not be what i think is professional great example of that is um when we talk about the truth and our culture being direct and being truthful is our love language that's the mm-hmm. like when i tell you that that shirt don't look good or i tell you that mm-hmm. you're doing this the wrong way that's mm-hmm. me showing you respect because i care mm-hmm. about you and and I want you to do the right thing. But if you talk to a white person, especially white women, and I have this, where if you are too direct with them, they take that as being rude. You know, it's, mm-hmm. all, it's almost like professionals, professionalism is coded in deceit. They want you to mm-hmm. play this game where you're not being real and you're not, they don't want you to. And that's mm-hmm. something that I have found to be very problematic. And mm-hmm. so you have black people who come into these spaces totally unprepared for what they're dealing with. And so for me, and I'm still learning, there's always things Mm -hmm. that I'm learning, mistakes that I'm making, but I feel like there needs to be more black people in corporate speaking up and out and not not only doing that, but providing resources to other black people who are coming through the ranks. How do I get a sponsor and a mentor? What's the difference between the two? What's professionalism? Why is it rooted in white culture and how is that a problem? How to deal with managers who are gaslighting you? Um, mm. Imposter syndrome. That's another struggle that I had where. Imposter like, syndrome? Imposter syndrome. Am Explain. I qualified? Yeah, so imposter syndrome is a feeling of not being worthy. You know, black people have been conditioned to think of ourselves as, yes. you know, second best. And so oftentimes mm. you see black people in corporate who are extremely overqualified for the jobs that they get. Because they have to be. You got to work twice as hard to get half as far. And so it comes with this sense of, am I good enough? Without realizing that you, not only are you good enough, you are oftentimes more qualified than the people that you're reporting into or the people that you work next to. I work in human resources. I have an MBA and a PHR, which is a professional human resources. That's a very well recognized certification in addition to other certifications that I have under that. So I'm, I'm oftentimes coming into my roles already skilled up and overqualified than Mm -hmm. my white cohort coworkers. And you have to be even to get acknowledged or to get your foot in the door. Mm -hmm. And a great example of that is I won't name this company. I won't name names. I do on my podcast, but out of respect for yours, I won't name names. Well, it's up to you. Uh, okay, if it's, up, if, it's, if it's up to me, I'll name it. You know, I just... Name you know, I, it. So name the company it. name is XBX Transformer Solutions. Hmm. And when I first interviewed there, I was studying for my PHR certification. I told them that I had my, I was going to get my certification. That's a hard certification to get. For anyone who's in HR, they'll tell you that. 50% of people who take that test fail on the first hmm. try. It's a very hard hmm. certification. I got my, I took the test that Saturday and I passed. I passed mm-hmm. on my first go. I started that job on a Monday. That job was extremely stressful. The managers that I worked with in that role were some of the worst people I've ever worked for. Mm-hmm. And I, I stayed there for a year and I quit that job. They ended up hiring a white girl with little to no experience, period. Mm-hmm. She had she had a bachelor's degree, but she had no no other certifications, no hands on experience. Now she's coming in making the same amount of money that I'm making with none of the experience. That's what I'm talking about when it mm-hmm. comes to black professionals. And that happens we, so much. That happens so much. And that's just mm-hmm. complete garbage. Now she's coming in. And they're going to invest in her. They're going to pour into mm-hmm. her. They're going to build her up. Mm-hmm. But I was told that I had to have all of this just to come into the mm-hmm. same position. Right. And this is mm-hmm. these are the experiences that black people face at a constant. We are told that like, you can't come into this job, Francesca, unless you got all these degrees and certifications. Mm-hmm. But you'll have a white person with no experience, don't have half as much as you got, don't, may not even be that driven. But right. they'll turn around and pour into them 
And when I say poor, I always, when I, I, I use that word poor, you know, they'll mentor them, they'll sponsor them, they'll give them projects and assignments designed to build them up. If they make mistakes or, you know, something's wrong, hey, this is okay, you're learning. This is a learning mm, curve. We're willing mm, to work mm, with you. Mm. Um, I used to, I worked at Harley Davidson, another company mm, job, and I was there a year and I actually won an award for mm. the work that I had done. There was one mistake that I made in terms of the pay. I was off by a dollar. It was mm. it was for a few positions that I was recruiting for. And it went from Jessica, you're doing a really good job to being treated as if I had stolen company funds. Mm. And it got to mm. the point where I'm like, what's going on here? But I was documenting and keeping receipts because that's what I do. That's one of the things you advise, yes. I bet. Yeah, I, absolutely. Oh, yes. Always yes. advise that. Yes, and yes exactly. I was severance. I was severance for that job. But because she knew that I was keeping receipts and tracking how unfair this was, I got a severance, which was like 12 weeks. That's a mm, lot of money to give somebody mm-hmm, who was there mm-hmm, only a year. Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. again, that goes back to my point is that black people are not giving grace. We're not allowed to fail. We're not allowed to make mistakes. We have to come in so skilled up and so ready to go that it's stressful for us to be in these spaces. And it it, it does feed into imposter syndrome feeling, hey, am I qualified enough? It's stressful. What what happens if I make a mistake? Will I lose my job? You know, mm-hmm. would I get demoted? You should be able to make mistakes and grow and and, 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 and learn from that, but we're not given those things. So mm. for me, my platform is to call that out, call out companies and managers who do that, and also to provide a resource for black people in these spaces so that they know how to navigate all these different minefields that set up for us to fail. So how do how do you teach them to navigate those minefields? What is it? What are the, some of the like maybe five points or five main things that you teach them? Because everything that you're saying, you know, I've been out of corporate America for a long time, but it certainly mm-hmm. existed. And, it, and, you know, honestly, Jessica, it breaks my heart that it still exists. Oh, yeah. That it, it still, still exists it after still all exists. these years. It still exists. I mean, you still got you got some companies out there. I'm actually doing a lot of interview with companies out on the West Coast. And I can say that a lot of it is also regional, too. There's a mm-hmm. lot, there's a different mindset with the companies that I'm talking to out West than the companies that I'm talking to that I've dealt with in the Midwest. Yeah. So there's something to say about that where um, they are a lot more open-minded than other companies. And that's, that's something to take into effect. But when I talk to my fellow black professionals and when I post my content, the, the big things that I always advocate for is when you go into a space is you want to always do research. I think that's a huge Mm. thing about companies and not just companies managers. You want to do research. Oftentimes people have taken positions into companies or working under managers and they get in there and they realize that it is not a fit. You want to do Mm -hmm. research and you really want to advocate for yourself. You know, it is your career. So you need to Mm. be the advocate for your manager does not dictate to you what your career is and what is not. You want to advocate. So when I say advocate, you want to make sure that if I work for you, what opportunities are there to advance? How are you going to pour into me? How are you going to support me? Um, Are you going to allow me to get degrees and certifications and trainings so that I can always develop myself? Um, I'm a big proponent of making yourself a brand. That's I, that's what I've worked on. Like I am my own brand. So I take my skills and experiences with me. I'm a you. You got to look at yourself as a contractor almost, because that's kind of how mm. these jobs are now. You move around and you take what you are with you to all these positions, and and that's a big thing. Um, documentation is a really critical um, aspect that I'm a promoter for, and I use my example about what happened to me at Harley Davidson all the time. It's like. Look, I walked away with a severance because I was documenting and I was keeping, when I say document, I mean, I play no games. I'm talking about emails. I am talking about every time you sit down, you document. And I, and I even share an article on how detailed you should go with your documentation mm, and wonderful. giving examples about that. There is a, there's an article that I share from the New York Times where this black man was keeping, he was working at J.P. Morgan Chase. That's a big company. Mm-hmm. And he was talking about how they was not working with black people 
in the finance industry, even black people with money, you're talking about $500,000 or more. And these mm -hmm. people wasn't wanting to work with black people. And he was documenting that. And then he got demoted. And then eventually he quit and he sued. I mean, this brother had, he was recording people left and right. And he mm. had so much documentation that they had to yield and, and, and give him what he was asking for. Mm -hmm. So I use that as an example. And what happened to me at Harley Davidson, you know, she tried to say, well, we want to be fair. But it's not about being fair. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's not when you fire somebody, you don't give them money unless you know you're trying to cover up from something. That's absolutely it's, right. It's mm -hmm. not about fairness because if you were being fair, you wouldn't even fire this person in the first place. So when she tried to tell me that she was being fair, what she was saying was we want to cover ourselves. So here's some money. So I always, I always talk about that. Um, sponsors and mentors um, is really important. A lot of black professionals get into their career and they don't have anyone sponsoring them, which means advocating for them, speaking their name in rooms that they're not in, um, pouring into them, giving them access to projects and opportunities that would grow and advance them. A lot of black professionals are overly mentored, which is a mentor is really kind of guiding you through the company. This is what you do. This is what you don't do, which is great. But then like the micromanaged kind of, is that what so, you mean? Well, well, what mentors are like, if I'm your mentor, I'm mentoring mm -hmm. you about the company. This is what you, you know, how to navigate the company, the space, you know, who to work mm -hmm. with, who not to work with. That's really what a mentor is, you know, helping you in terms of like your resume, how to sell yourself. That's what a mentor is by and large, which isn't a bad thing. Mm -hmm. But then what happens when it's time to advocate? I want you mm -hmm. to advocate for me now. You know, this is a project. Speak my name. You know, put me on. You know, black people love to say, put me on game. Like, right, you know, right, right. You know, that's what we need. And that's where the gap comes in, where these mentors mm -hmm. just stop at being mentors and not sponsoring and advocating for black professionals, bringing them into these spaces that they can't always get access to. That's what we need. And that's what I talk about. And then also just, you know, the one of the biggest things I talk about, too, and, and the things that I do with Blackness in the workplace is just protecting your career. How do you protect mm. yourself? Mm. You know, when you work with these people, understanding coworkers are not friends. Companies are not forever. You know, it's OK to move around if, you know, people talk about don't be a job hopper. It's OK to move around if a job is not a good fit. Mm -hmm. Move around, jump, you mm -hmm. know, do what you got to mm -hmm. do. So that those are the things that I talk about constantly when I'm when I'm when I'm posting content or you know the podcast or talking to black people one on one. That's my philosophy and it's Do you think we get caught up in the idea that they are our friends because they might invite us to their party or their out to mm -hmm. lunch or that kind of thing. And so because of the kind of people that we are, mm -hmm. it feels like friendship. It feels like it's something but when the shit hits the fan. You, you, you know, know, I think I think this isn't just a problem with black professionals. There is this culture in the workplace where it's expected for you to go to happy hour after work. Yes, it's expected yes, for you to yes. hang out with coworkers and be friends with them. It's almost this hustle and grind mentality that we've kind of had in the workplace in, over the last few years where it's like, if you don't hang out with me after work, you're not going to get a promotion or yeah. you know, people are going to think of you the wrong way. And we really mm -hmm. got to move away from that and get mm -hmm. back to work is work and a job is just mm -hmm. a job mm -hmm. and work life balance is really important. It's okay to go to lunch with coworkers. It's okay. If you want to, if you want to, to hang out with them after work, but it's not an, it should not be an expectation that when I start a job, I absolutely have to be friends with you. We're not friends. When I lost, like, for example, when I lost my job at Harley, none of my coworkers called me and asked me how I was doing. You know, these, these were people who I went to lunch with you know, hung out with. And I, I knew they weren't friends, but I'm just saying, like, they didn't call. I, they didn't I know exactly Let me help you find about. a job. Let me, mm -hmm. let me open some doors for you. Didn't nobody do that for me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you got to take that with a grain of salt. Don't come in. I can't stress this enough. Coworkers are not friends. They are coworkers. If it, if it happens... Sorry, if it happens where a relationship does deepen and develop outside of the workplace, that's fine. But you shouldn't force it and you shouldn't expect it. So how do you maneuver through that? Because from the white perspective, 
if you're not, if I invite you to lunch and you're not going to lunch with me, then you're being whatever. Or if like, hey, I'm having a, a, a company party and we want you to come and you don't come, then you're being some kind of something that they think you're being, but you have a life of your own, you know, and you recognize that we're not friends and my time would be better invested over here with mm-hmm. my family, my friends, my whatever, because... I need to take care of my being. How do you guide them through that? Because those people that those white people that they work for and with are looking at it from their perspective and defining something about you where you're just being what's best for you. Yeah. And that's the tricky part. I think a lot of companies really have have started to recognize that being a problem. And really, there's companies now, depending on where you are that are really bringing back the work-life balance. And I think mm, COVID mm-hmm. has really kind of mm. exposed that where mm. pe- companies are understanding that people have lives and my job prospects cannot be dependent on whether or not I go out to happy hour with you. Yeah, You know, right, because I have right. a life outside of work and that has to be respected too. I also say that you need to kind of judge your own situation. You know, mm-hmm. there are some people who do like going out you know, mm-hmm. it's nothing wrong every once in a while doing it if you want to or if you have the time. But again, it should not be the expectation. It should um, be the expectation. Yeah, it shouldn't mm-hmm. be the expectation at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you want, co- if you want your coworkers to hang out, do it during company time. Mm-hmm. Because I'm not getting paid to hang mm-hmm. out with you on a Friday night. Mm-hmm. Do a uh, what's what is, what do they call it? A potluck. Do that during working hours. If you right. do it during working hours, okay. I don't have a problem with that. I'm getting paid either way. Mm-hmm. I can sit there and have lunch with you. But if you asking me, you know, Thursday at 6, 8, 6 p.m. to come kick it with you for an hour or two, that's taking away a time for my family. I see you 30 right. hours every week. So I don't think there's anything wrong with setting clear boundaries. Mm-hmm. And if you have a manager and if that's how they're assessing you is whether or not you kick it with them and hang out with is that someone you really want to report into as a manager? Uh, yes, yes. What are you? What are you? What's your criteria for me getting a promotion? Because if it's right. brown nosing and and hanging out with people, then you're not looking at my skill set anyway. Right. You know, exactly. This, this is not going to work. Mm-hmm. That's a lot of how their relationships do work, though. Their yeah, relationships. A lot of networking. A lot of yes, interpersonal yes. networking. Yes. Yes. And again, black people are like, "Hey, work is done. I'm going. Right. To I gotta go. I gotta right, go exactly. home." Mm-hmm. And so there. You have to understand how your organization works. There is a balance to that. But mm-hmm. again, like, I'm not going to hang out with you every single day. We're not. Fr- I had one coworker try to friend me on Facebook. I'm a big believer in, I don't, I don't hang, my friends are not on, my coworkers are not connected with me on Facebook. Maybe yeah, after right. we, I leave this job or after you right. leave the job, maybe right. if I like right. you, but right. I don't, we're not friends on social media. So. Yeah, because you never even know what their intention is with that. Either. I just I yeah. think that's very but, uh, problematic because who you are at home and who you are on social media can be two different things. And mm-hmm. social media has gotten a lot of people fired mm-hmm. <laughs> for better or for worse. And mm-hmm. I'd rather just keep those two worlds very separate. So what are some of the highs for, for you from the work that you do? I like getting messages from people. I get a lot of private DMs. Um, there are people, the content that I post on LinkedIn, there are people who feel like they can't like it publicly because they're mm-hmm. afraid of what their managers or coworkers mm-hmm. might say, which mm-hmm. again, is a problem. If I, I, if, if I can't like something, like the content I post is, you know, is advocating for black employees in the workplace, um, Black Lives Matter, so if you have a problem with it, it says more about you than about me. But yes. as an employee, I can't imagine working somewhere where I'm so afraid to like something because my manager is overlording me. I think that's a problem. But I have a lot of people who will private message me and say, Jessica, I really like the content that you put out. I can't mm-hmm. like it publicly because my boss will see it. Um, or I have people say, you know, I listened to your podcast and I learned a lot. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm. You know, really getting a lot of thank yous mm-hmm. from people who are very, very appreciative of the content. They also are very appreciative of me being as outspoken as I am because they feel like mm-hmm. they themselves cannot be. And that's fine. I mean, it's, I don't feel like every black person has to take up the mantle and speak out. You know, there's plenty of us that do it. And then there's some of us who can't do it. And I have to respect where everyone's coming from. But those are some of the highs is when I get that feedback. That's awesome. I love it. 
uh, I wonder in what you just said, do you believe, because I do, mm. but do you believe that sometimes we have an unfounded fear, you know, especially in these times where white folks are trying to do better. You know, they want to do better. They Sometimes they don't know how, but they want some. to do some. <laughs> yeah, some. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's why we call people performative allies. Yeah. Um, but sometimes you may have a fear of if I like this, my boss is going to see it and I may have this consequence when it's really your fear and not necessarily what might happen. Do you think that sometimes it's our fear that we're Yeah, I, I, would, from? I would say that, you know, I, when I first started on LinkedIn, LinkedIn was a platform initially where it was just, a picture of yourself looking as professional mm-hmm. as you can be and all your job history. And that was it. You didn't talk about right. politics. You didn't talk about right. social issues. None of that. People used to say LinkedIn is not Facebook. People used to say that all the time. And mm-hmm. I used to be afraid of what would happen if I posted my social and political views on this platform. Will it impact my ability to find a job? Will it mm-hmm. impact my ability, my career? And for the most part, it hasn't. And so when I started speaking out and I started seeing other people speaking out, now you, you people understand that the social and the political and the economic, they're all intertwined. Yeah. And, you know, I can't take my skin off and go to work and pretend yes. not to be black. And right. you have people who are, you know, other, you know, other people, Latina, Asian, LGBT, everyone is coming out and speaking about their, their experiences. And so now you're starting to see companies respond to that. And the companies, you have some companies who are performative, but you have companies who are really taking that into consideration and really mm-hmm. changing their policies and really pushing the needle for it. You mm-hmm. know, when I worked at Harley, the manager that I reported into, I remember she she tried to come at me. I had published an article about black women and the need to keep receipts and documentation and mm. why that's so important. And the reason why I published that, this was a while back. Um, I don't. I don't like her, but I'm going to use her as an example. Amarosa. Mm. They was interviewing uh-huh. Amarosa, and she had this book, and she said that I can prove everything that I'm saying. And she was talking right. to this white man, and she was like, well, I have receipts. And, I, and, the, and the man didn't understand initially what she was saying. I was like, well, right. she got receipts. Right. And, right. and she did, to her credit. Right. So that was why I wrote the, 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 the mm-hmm. article. And then my manager, she was like, well, you wrote this article um, telling people not to trust human resources and and I just I was really offended by that because one you didn't read the article two mm-hmm. I'm a grown exactly. woman right. I'm a grown woman don't police me you know right. I'm just like who are you like don't right. police what I'm so I didn't take it down <laughs> and since then I published it everywhere and now my platform is what it is so there is a mixture of fear but at the same time if your manager is trying to say something about you because you are talking about equality, which is what Black Lives Matters are. If you're talking about, you know, I talk about anti-LGBT people. I call them out mm. because I'm, you know, I'm all about equality when it comes to all black people, not just straight. Um, mm-hmm. I talk about women's rights. I talk about social issues, economic issues that impacts everybody, whether they black, white, brown, whatever. If you are coming at me because you have a problem with the content that I'm putting out there, that says more about you than it does mm-hmm. about me. And I, mm-hmm. to my credit, I haven't had anybody say anything because, again, what are you going to say that doesn't make you look bad? So I think black right. people really need to realize that it says more about them than it does about you. And you Which helps you us advantage. become more unapologetic about right. who we are. And, and, you know, and I think... If the time was never right before, the time is right right now. Because mm-hmm. I tell white people all the time, I teach a class to white people um, on deconstructing racism. And I, I, you know, I do it in the corporate environment and I do it individually. Mm-hmm. And I, one of the things I say, I make this point, is understand this. That the black people that you are looking at, facing, talking to today are not the same black people that you were talking to a year ago. Yeah. We are unapologetically black. You know, it's like the, we have accepted a greater part of our own value in a way that we've never, you know, merged with it before. Right. And I think it's important that we speak. We, we you know, it's fear is up to me. Fear you step into. You don't sidestep fear. Fear is you, you step into courageously. Mm-hmm. 
And you get to find out that fear was just your fear, was your imagination. Yeah. It isn't always really the outcome of a situation. Right. And you, you, I'm starting to see black people from my parents' generation mm-hmm. start to speak out a lot more. You know, these were the people mm-hmm. who were like, work is work. We don't, we, we don't want right. to upset nobody. We don't want to lose our job. And now right. they're coming and saying, you know what? The younger generation is absolutely right. And mm-hmm. one of the things I say is, the idea that we have to assimilate has always been BS because we, you're going to be black no matter what. There's no such thing. You're never going to be accepted. No. So you might as well embrace who you are. Who you are. You Thank might as well you. say be, that okay. again. Jessica. You might as well embrace who right. you are. You are never mm-hmm. going to be accepted mm-hmm. on their level. So you need right. to be who you are. And once you step into who you are and embrace that, whatever that may be, that gives you a, a stronger sense of who you are and it gives you a power that can't nobody touch. And yeah, now you're man, seeing a right. lot of people coming and saying, this is who I am. I am okay mm-hmm. with this. And this you have to accept me for who I am or we, we can't work together. Or this is not going to happen. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. companies are seeing that. Managers are seeing that and they're going to have to deal with it. You're seeing people, you're seeing white people left and right lose their jobs because they're not That's getting right. with the program. You That's like right. there was one man just recently in Tennessee, he was a CEO and it was a video of him coming after this young man who was wearing a dress for prom, something like that. He was very mm-hmm. anti-gay and it was insane. And he lost his job. He was a CEO. Mm. No job is safe and you lost your job because That's you couldn't right. get with the program. You, right. You're seeing white people now just posting stuff on social media and then coming into work the next day and getting fired. Mm-hmm. And I have no sympathy for that right. because mm-hmm. this is the new, the new situation that we are this in now. This is what we, change looks like. Change looks mm-hmm. like, and no one's going to sit up here and pretend to be something that they are not. Like, like I said before, I wear my hair natural on to the interviews now because I'm not going to perm and relax my hair. It is what it is. I take this off. I moisturize it. I pick it out and I go to right here mm-hmm. and it, show mm-hmm. up. That's who I am. I wear my hair in braids or, you know, whatever. I'm, I'm outspoken online. I actually had an interview just recently and um, the lady asked me about my podcast. It was a white woman. She asked me about, you know, I put it on my resume, you know, found mm-hmm. in a blackness workplace. And she asked me about my podcast and I spoke and I said, yeah, you know, this is my podcast. This is what we talk about. And then she asked for the link. She was like, yeah, I would love to listen to it. And I said, here you go. I want you to hear it because mm-hmm. this is, mm-hmm. you hire me. This is who I am. This is who I am. And this is what I'm right. going to bring into your organization. Mm-hmm. And I look at it as a value add. That's why I put it on my resume. Mm-hmm. It's, mm-hmm. it's a value it's an added service to have someone like me coming into your organization with the views and the experiences that I bring. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So who is your target specifically? Black people. <laughs> black, I, know, I knew you were going to say black people. Uh, black, black people, people um, in the workplace. Black right. people in the workplace. I say black professionals because mm-hmm. I'm always, my focus has always been more on that corporate side. Yeah. But uh-huh. everything that I say can be used for, for whatever, for wherever you are. So that's, th- that's the, that's the target. But then again, mm-hmm. I have content that I've developed for like black people who are still in college, like first generation, mm. kind of moving up. People mm. who are entry level professionals. You know, I try to keep it targeted to black people, but also broad in that black people from all levels, all walks of life can mm. tap into this. You know, we did a I did a series on our podcast called um Rebuilding Black Wall Street, where we mm. talk about financial health. So I started from the beginning. What's credit? Mm. Understanding credit. How to manage your money, redefining mm-hmm. wealth, um, black owned businesses. And that's information mm-hmm. and content that everybody can use. Because mm-hmm. just because you got Absolutely. a PhD don't yeah. mean you understand credit or that that's you got good exactly credit. right. So mm-hmm. that's kind of who I target. Now, um, I have a following that's primarily black professionals, especially black women. But then I also mm-hmm. have a lot of white women or white people, too, who follow the content that I post. And that's mm-hmm. fine. Like, I have no problem with people from different racial backgrounds following. But know that if you follow me, it's always going to be centered in blackness. Mm-hmm. That's the name of the mm-hmm. podcast, Blackness in the right. Workplace. Right. You follow, right. and if you want to, you're following because you're trying to learn and you are, you, you know, you're curious, that's fine with me. But when I post, I'm always centering blackness. And if you come into my space, you have to understand that. And, and if you're trying to co-op and center yourself, whether whether you're white, Asian, brown, whatever, you're going to get caught out because that's not that's not the purpose of my platform. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
Wow. What you know, I wish you existed when I was a young and trying to work. I, I wish a lot of these existed when I first started out. Mm-hmm. A lot of these and platforms are new. I even wish, because I'm a lot older than you, I wish that I had had even the thought, the wherewithal to do what you're doing for people coming behind me. I mean, you know, and I, I, I look at that and it's like, I, I, I maneuvered through it and learned a lot. And, you know, I would help anyone who asked me a question, but what you're doing is it gives people a place to go right. to, to learn and to find how to maneuver through the white world that we live in. Yeah, I you think know? the mindset, too, between the generations have shifted. You know, it was kind of mm-hmm. like what I've noticed with a lot of older black people is like, I got mine, you get yours, you learn. I had to learn, so you got to learn. And so it wasn't a lot of that turning around and lifting as you climb, which is mm-hmm. it's ironic because it's very much a part of the cultural identity is that village mindset. But you didn't see that in corporate. You had a lot of black people when they got into these spaces they were not turning around and opening the door and trying to help. They were very much like, I got mine, you go get yours. Um, you had that crab mentality going on. And it's it's nothing worse than when it comes from your own people. When your own I people experienced not, it. Yeah, and I've experienced it too, where you, you mm-hmm. see someone just, you know, they say all skin folk is not kin folk. And That's it's right. Very true. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. But what I'm starting to see with people in my group, age group, or, you know, whatever you want to call it, is there's a lot more collaboration. I've been on other people's podcasts. I have other people on mine. There's been a mm-hmm. lot more collaboration in this space of saying, hey, we are all in this together. together, And we yes. are all doing the same thing. So why are we all on our own little island? Mm-hmm. We need to come to, we're stronger together. And it's, mm-hmm. you're seeing a lot of young black people understand. Because one thing about white people that's that's something that we really need to learn is even if white people disagree with each other, they understand that they are still white and they that's still right. come together for the that's common good right. of whiteness. And black people are just now starting to see that and starting to realize that that is a strength. Even if I don't agree with you, whatever, you know, we are still black people. We understand that we got to connect for the common good. Mm-hmm. And we are one of the only groups of people that for a long time was not trying to do that. Mm-hmm. And you're starting to see that change. And it's really exciting to see that in this space. So, Jessica Jessica Parm, how do they find you? So, I am on LinkedIn. For your podcast, I know. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm on LinkedIn, of course. You know, um, I'm also um, www.blacknessintheworkplace.com. All mm-hmm. one word. Um, and then we are on Facebook. We are on Twitter. Twitter is really where, like, those, those live conversations happen. So mm. if you follow me on Twitter, definitely um, you, you'll get a lot of that. And then our podcast is on, that, on our website too. So again, it's www.blacknessintheworkplace.com. Um, our new podcast season is going to be rolling out here shortly. So season mm. three will be, will be launching mm. soon. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I am so grateful that you exist. <laughs> Thank you. And, and 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 we found each other through LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. So LinkedIn yeah, is a LinkedIn. beneficial place to be. You know, I was great. not on LinkedIn. I had I I had a LinkedIn page, and did and never was even ever ever mm-hmm. ever ever on LinkedIn until recently. And I'm finding out, wow, there's a wealth of information here. What a great place to be. I like LinkedIn better than anything else. Yes. Social media. Yes. You know, for my purposes right now, of where I am in life. I tell black uh, professionals, you really need to be on LinkedIn now because mm-hmm. there's a well, there's there's a community of black professionals who are all like big name black people mm-hmm. who have huge followings on um on uh, LinkedIn. One example, her name is Madison Butler. She has a huge following, and I'm connected with her. And mm-hmm. there's a, there was an article called um, Black LinkedIn on in the New York Times. The, the title escapes me. Um, and mm-hmm. they interviewed me and a number of other. Um, black people who have large followings on LinkedIn. So if you are a mm-hmm. black professional, you need to, you can connect with me through connecting with me will give you access to a lot of those big names. Mm-hmm. But that is where you're going to hear those conversations be had. Um, there's a lot of information about like finding jobs and how to really navigate those spaces. People are putting out this content for free. You don't have to yes. pay for it for free. Yes. That's really yes. important because Oftentimes when people sell services, that's a big hindrance for black people is that they try to sell it at, at these crazy prices that people are like, come on, like this is information that should be accessible for everybody. So, yeah, definitely take advantage of LinkedIn and connect with those voices on that platform. Mm. Jessica, I'm so glad to know you. You moving out to L.A.? 
Um, I am looking to move out <laughs> west, but not to LA. <laughs> not to LA. Oh not man, to LA. I don't know. <laughs> Not California. <laughs> California want too much money. California. California is crazy. Yeah. And then we got so. And so is got, Los Angeles. Yeah, LA is kind of crazy with the rent. It's it kind of crazy. It's always on fire. But guys got them fires <laughs> and there's always something going on out there. And I'm just like, oh, yeah. yeah, I'll it's dis- true. <laughs> Come visit us in the wintertime wherever you are, because every winter it's like we live here. Oh my god, it's so gorgeous outside. We forget that it's winter other place mm-hmm. but LA's got a lot of crazy oh, yeah. but I'm happy to I be believe here. it yeah. <laughs> I believe Jessica it. thank you so much for taking time with us today uh, thank and you for um me. and for, for you know what thank you for being who you are and for doing what you do because we need each other we need you we need what you are bringing and oh man I hope people just gravitate to you so that we can buoy up and buoy up and buoy up and be the world that is intended always, well, wasn't intended by the people that started this country, but, <laughs> but the world that is intended to be. Exactly. Where we are an unapologetic, courageous, and, and elegant, and valuable, and all the things that we are as, as black people. So yep, thank you. Definitely. Thank you. I appreciate you. All right. Take care. Bye.